Chairman of the East Neighbor Culture Society Board, uh, and I'm going to let her tell you have the rest about yourself from there. Uh, so here's Erin Forbes. I'm going to start talking about this. I have been. This is a slide presentation. That I've actually got this new kind of program that I've been doing with my local bee club, where I'm teaching really small topics for a really long time. And this is like a two and a half hour deal, which I'm gonna do way faster than that. So anyway, uh, we've seen those pictures of my crap. But again, like I said, when you have all the equipment, it makes it a lot easier. And so this is, you know, I, I get it that if you have limited equipment or you have foundation, it's gonna be harder to uh, institute some of these things. But I want to talk a little bit about swarming. It's funny because like basically any talk that you get me to give, I will at some point be like, this is my favorite talk to give because the favorite thing about bees is this. And then the next thing is like, oh, my favorite thing about bees is this. But swarming is really one of my favorite things to talk about um, because it's really one of the bees' favorite things to do. And they and I get along. And so I like to do what they like to do. Um, I'm going to go all the way back to the very basics, which I think that it's always nice to start from the beginning. But we all know that baby queens are raised by the nurse bees, right? The person who decides that a queen is going to become a queen is the nurse bees, and that all female fertilized eggs are created equal. And so the first thing that happens in the spring when we start moving into queen rearing um, is the incoming new food, and then we start having new brood, and that's the beginning of the swarming project. And beekeepers, particularly older beekeeping books, like when I first started beekeeping, I was reading a lot of, um, you know, like C.C. Miller and that kind of that 50s kind of uh, attitude about beekeeping. And there's a, a big kind of depression and um, suppression of the natural aspects of swarming and what that does for your colonies and why they want to do it. And kind of... Uh, all kinds of work on trying to prevent colonies from swarming. And really, the reality is this is what the bees want to do. There's a number of reasons why the bees want to swarm, reproduction being the biggest one. But it's also good in terms of their own um, hive health management. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But so I, I really, there's almost nothing that I get more excited about than swarming. So all of these things that I'm going to talk about both happen on and should never be done before the main dandelion bloom. So main dandelion bloom is the first real reliable incoming nectar and pollen in our climate up here. I mean, we have things that are before. We've got pussy willow. We've got red maple. We've got this thing and that thing. But often those things are blooming when the weather is too crappy for the bees to get out. But when the dandelion is on full bloom, then we have reliable food for the bees. They're completely, quote unquote, out of the weeds. It almost, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't snow after the dandelion. Okay, so the very most basics of swarming and what is happening is typically in a reproductive swarm, the old queen is leaving with the first issuing swarm, and that means that the new parent gets the new baby queen who then mates and comes back. So the old colony is the one that gets new genetics, and the new colony is the one that has the old genetics. Does that make sense? We're following, is everybody following me down the road? Who already knows all of this and doesn't need to hear any of it? Okay, good, all right. Nobody's like, oh, whatever. Okay, so, um, you know, we like to pretend that there's only one new baby queen in the colony when the colony swarms, particularly when you're mentoring your beginner beekeeper who's just freaking out. You're like, oh, don't worry, there's, there's a new baby queen in there. And you usually don't say, or maybe 11. Um, <laughs> but, um, but there are maybe 11, and we can take advantage of that as beekeepers, and we'll talk about that and how and why. Um, and then after swarming is what happens when there are quite a few new baby queens, and sometimes the colony breaks up into a second little swarm or a third little swarm with some of those um, little baby virgins. And then when the new queen is mated, um, the, col the colony comes back to being queen right. And this is just normal. This is absolutely what the bees want to do. Okay. 
So there's our little swarm. This is what it looks like when they're doing it. Um, so there's a couple of different kinds of swarming, and overcrowding swarming is another, is a secondary issue, uh, which is often you see around raising nucleus colonies. You can have overcrowded swarming in your nukes if you don't give them enough space. Also in mating nucleus colonies, you often see overcrowding swarming. And so what, what is happening is that by putting your colony into a too small a cavity, it's simulating some of their own natural triggers that they use during reproductive swarming. And so they not really mistake the triggers, they recognize the triggers and do it. Um, you'll see this also often in your observation hives. Um, and so it's just understanding that crowding is part of the deal. So um, with reproductive swarming, the goal is colony level production, I mean reproduction. And um, you know, people often say to me, particularly beginner beekeepers, whose hives swarm today will be like, I don't understand that we're thinking, I just put a new box on three days ago or last weekend. And the deal is it's too late because they started this 20 to 30 days before. And so that's really um, the most important thing to realize is that this process takes 20 to 30 days from before the swarm comes is when they started doing it. And you need to kind of do that. Um, so, I like to think about a couple of different things uh, in terms of swarming, and I, I don't want to anthropomorphize the bees too much, but I do explain some things in kind of in those terms, which I think helps a lot. Um, and I want to talk quickly, actually we're going to talk about over, I'm going to stand here and explain something about overcrowding. And I hope that this makes sense, and this is an analogy that works for you guys, but it's, I want to talk about queen pheromone for a minute. So queens produce pheromones in their bodies that the bees use to recognize their own colony and their queen rightness. And the way I like to explain these pheromones is that it is a pheromone that's more like tasting than it is like smelling. This is a pheromone that you cannot sense unless you actually physically touch the pheromone. And so I like to say it's like playing cards. So the queen, if, if I'm the queen, I am secreting from my own body Say, for example, 20 Red Sox playing cards an hour. And anybody who comes in contact with me, I just hand the playing cards out. And then as the individual bees in the hive, you guys interact with each other, the very first thing you say is, hi, do you have any playing cards? And you might have a, like, a tiny nothing nor, or none, and you have some, and if he doesn't have any, you turn around, rip yours in half, and give it to him. And then he meets somebody else, and they turn around. And so now we're handing out these playing cards. And meanwhile, also, these playing cards poof out of dis existence in about 45 minutes. And so we're handing, I'm handing out these cards, and people are sharing the bits. And the, and the foragers who come back from the field full of nectar and pollen come in. They have no more playing card because they've been out and they're poofed away for 45 minutes. They come in and they hand it out. So as the colony gets more and more crowded, if I'm still producing the same amount of playing card every hour and everybody is ripping theirs in half and giving them to them, you imagine that you start having only little tiny corners of the playing card. That is what queen pheromone is like. And, so, and then when the playing cards are so tiny and we get so few, so little queen pheromone around, because we're so crowded, we're ripping it in half, that's when we start rearing new baby queens. Does this make sense? So, okay, so that it's just a good way of thinking about it. And also, it's in the, I mean, this is like the thing about, you know, newspaper method of combining two colonies, is that, you know, people are all, get all hung up in newspaper method. But if you just make one of the two colonies that you're going to combine queenless, they have no pheromone at all, and they, so everybody has no playing cards, and then nobody fights. Uh, conversely, if you just add to put two queen right colonies right next to each other, and you put a bunch of people in here with Yankees cards because they are, have their queen, who is you know Cindy B is their queen, and then the Yankees and the Red Sox people fight, right? And so that's what que what QMP is all about. It's this is the playing cards, but recognizing that they are touched and they also expire is important. Okay, so space versus foundation. And this is the same thing that I keep saying when I show the picture of all the equipment in my shed. Foundation is not laying space. Like space to a bee colony is a place to put food or eggs. Foundation is like nothingness. And so 
Adding space in the colony, when I'm saying space, what I'm saying is available colony space, not um, foundation. And so here's a colony that looks like they might be feeling a little swarmy. <laughs> um, so, and adding a box of that is not going to prevent anything. Um, adding this allows the queen to lay eggs, and that's really an important thing. So, to delay swarming, you can add empty or nearly empty drawn comb around your brood nest. You can add more boxes to the hive to allow the queen to lay in a whole new area. And you can also add honey super space for the bee, house bees to move nectar out of the brood area. Like these are things that can delay swarming. So let's say you have that big colony that I was just looking at, these guys, and you go and you try to find the queen because you want to try to artificial swarm, which I'm going to talk about later, and you simply can't find the queen. And so now you're like, what am I going to do? I've, you know, I can't come back until next Saturday. If you add a whole nother box for that queen to lay in, or even more importantly, judiciously move those frames around then, and add laying space right at the edge of the brood nest, then you can A, make space to delay the swarming impulse. So we can have more space for the bees. B, you can add a honey super to get more space for the nectar to get out of here. And C, also, you can find your queen generally, in your new laying space. So it makes it much easier to come back and look for your queen the next day. If you had a whole big box of brood comb, a drawn brood comb, you're going to find her laying in there. It's going to be much easier to locate her than when she's in this very crowded space trying to find a couple of empty cells to lay eggs in. Okay. So to prevent swarming, you have to actually interrupt the colony's ability to swarm. You can eliminate all but one queen cell, and then you can add drawn comb to allow the colony to move. So to prevent the colony, manipulate the colony to interrupt their ability to swarm. So what am I saying there? That's a big thing. So this is who it takes to swarm. And if you remove any of these three components of the swarming colony, any one of those can be removed. And if you do, they cannot swarm. They could be going to swarm in one minute. And if you come and you remove one of these three things, they can't do it. So if they're going to swarm in one minute and you go in the colony, you find the queen, you cage her, you take her, and you put her in your pocket, they cannot swarm. If you remove the brood and house bees from the colony, they cannot swarm. Or if you remove the field force. So how would you remove the brood and the house bees or remove the field force? So let's just play this for a second here. So if I am... So we're back in my yard, right? And so I've got, whatever, 40 colonies. But we're just going to play with two. We're going to pretend we're in your yard and you have more impulse control than I do. So here's my number one colony that's about to swarm. It's super giant. And over here is my just regular other colony that's not about to swarm. They're not dead, but they're not the one that was super strong with the earliest colony in the world. If I switch the location of these two colonies, what's going to happen? Let's say I do it at night, right? So tonight. I go and I take that colony and I put it here and I take this colony and I put it there. So now I'm the swarming colony over here. I'm the big swarming one, but I was over there. But tomorrow morning, my field force is going to fly out to those little yellow flowers that are all on the balcony, and they're not going to look at where they are, but they're going to fly right back into over there, right? So I just took the field force out of my picture and now prevented this colony from being able to swarm. Also boosted that colony by giving them a field force. I haven't totally removed the field force from this one because the field force from that one is going to come over here. But it's a great move for if you need to, if you're trying to slow your colony down. Now granted, if they've got queen cells in here, you're going to have another, they're going to start that process again. Yes, we have a question. Well, will the field force, uh, do, they, do they know that they've changed queens? No. They, so they wouldn't fight? They will not fight. Those people will not fight them because they are carrying food. Yes? Uh, how, far, how, how, much of a move? how much of a move do we have to make? You have to be more than three feet. So if your colonies, like, but so, yes, from there to here, they will, you will completely lose your field force on the two. If you're two or three feet away, they may actually, particularly if the hives are well marked, they may actually end up back at their colony. But this far of a move, 10 feet or 8 feet, is plenty to completely change the field force. Which is, nice, which is a good thing to bear in mind when you're setting up your apiary. Instead of putting three right on one hive stand, maybe have two hive stands so that you can move back and forth. 
And so the other thing that you could have done is you could have actually taken the frames of brood out of the colony and moved them. Now, generally, that's something that people won't often do. And it's much easier to move the whole colony than it would be to take all the brood out. But if you did actually take all the brood out for one, for because you, for some reason, just had to test it, that would also work. But most importantly, if you just simply remove the queen, you prevent their ability to swarm. And that is the process of called artificial swarming. And I'll talk more about that. So let's talk a little bit about when this is all going to happen. So the swarm preparations literally start when the length of day expands. So right now, they're starting to think about it. Like anybody who isn't dead, any single absolute colony in the state of Massachusetts and Maine that is not dead and not very sick right now, and if they were very sick right now, they're probably dead, um, is starting to think about swarming. Like today, they're there. Let's get our program going. And as soon as food is available, they're going to start rearing drones. And so when you start seeing them rearing drones and then cap drone cells, you know that you are now on like step two of I'm deciding to swarm. Because they will not swarm until they actually have drones. It's very interesting. They, um, because of course the drones aren't really for their own queen to be mating with, although she could, because who knows who's going to get up there in the sky. But you know, it's kind of the trigger. They're sending their their drones out to the next colony. Um, the population increases and the queen pheromone is diluted, meaning those playing cards start getting smaller and smaller, and then available laying space becomes scarce. And this has to do with nectar coming into the colony, pollen coming into the colony, so they're using up cells that were in, that were in the area where the bees have been all winter. They're starting to put food in them, and the queen is competing with them for places to lay eggs. And we know that the swarm queen, quote unquote, loses weight before she can fly, right? Because laying queens can't fly. But they kind of call it like, how do they lose weight? And they run the queen around. I mean, it sounds like somebody put a leash on her and takes her like jogging behind your bike, right? You know what I mean? It's kind of this run the queen around. That's not what happens at all. Actually, what happens is the laying space becomes scarce. And so she has to walk all around, hunting all around the colony to find places to lay eggs. And she can lay less and less, which is why putting big, big frames of space to lay in helps delay the this, this swarming because she has the ability to lay. Okay. So, yes, so, question. So when, when you, you've got it over with in winter time and they're all uh, clustered in the top and, and the bottom is pretty much depleted and all that, that's basically what swapping the, the two deep does for you is be more. Exactly. So he's saying, he's saying at this time of year, when your bees are at the top and the bottom box is empty, one of the very common things that people suggest is to reverse the colonies. You put the empty one on top, and that makes more laying space, and yes, does delay that swarming trigger. They eat, and, but reversing hives is like beekeeping 110, right? Like literally just putting the thing on the bottom. Because frankly, it's almost never, do I have a whiteboard? No. Um, it's almost never that it is the correct temperature, meaning dandelions start at minimum, to be manipulating your colony, and in fact, that colony really only is in one box. And so if your, your colony, which is mostly in the top, is cresting down into the bottom, and so there's a little crest of brood in that next bottom box, and you straight up just flip the boxes apart, then you just took this crest of brood and separated it from the rest of the brood. It's up at the top, probably will get chilled and die. And so the, that's beekeeping 110. But beekeeping 215 is actually manipulate the frames. So that now, maybe what you'll do is take some of that second, take the bottom box aside, put the top box on the bottom, and then shift some of the frames from the center of that top box up into the box above and put the empty, fill in the empty space. And so now you make a big narrow oval instead of a circle at the bottom and a crest at the top. You see, we always want the brood to be connected to each other. Always the brood frames need to be together. But you, you can actually manipulate much more than just moving the whole box. And that's a much better way of making space. Yes, you had a question. So we get the uh, uh, frames that have the little crest that we're talking about. Uh, yes, and they would be at the edges of the oval. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm 
Yes, on either side, maybe a little bit. Right, exactly. So we'll take the big frames of brood, we'll split some of them above, and then we'll put the frames, that just the crest, against it so that they're all together. In fact, I would probably put the crest at, towards the in the bottom box and the other ones at the top so that the crest is down, is connected, is very solidly connected to the brood nest. Um, and so, and that's a great way of um, expanding the colony without, um, you know, without breaking up the brood cluster. So the other thing that I just completely like into my brain while I was saying this is one of the things that I find that is a, a very common kind of beginner, middle beekeeper thing is lots of people over manipulate their colonies. So as an instructor, it's kind of, it's my instinct to tell you don't over manipulate your colonies, don't check your bees too much, particularly in the winter, don't fool around with them. But the fact of the matter is Jim too actually says that the very most important inspections you ever do in the winter are often in the winter. And really the most, most, most important thing to do now is if you have dead colonies, go get their equipment and protect it from the mice. And if there's honey, like people will have a colony that died for other reasons, mite loads or whatever, with honey on one side of the yard, and then the other colony dies of starvation when there's a box of honey right next door. And so if you find that you have dead colonies that do have honey in them, this is the perfect time of year to pick a nice warm day, go clean up that equipment, and anything that it, if, it, if it has honey on it, just throw it on any live colony. Just very quickly, take your, you know, take the outer cover off, inner cover off, slap the box of honey on there, and then just put it back together. And no inspecting, no moving frames. But there's no, there's no such thing as too much honey. Like that is like if bees had a t-shirt, like I like your t let it be t-shirt. But literally if bees had a t-shirt, that would be their motto. There's no such thing as too much honey. Um, yes? Is there a shelf life to pollen? No. Is there a shelf life to pollen? No. I mean, pollen sometimes gets moldy and stuff, but bees know how to clean that up. There's, there's no shelf life, as far as the bees are concerned, to bee bread, which they have stored, even if it has, I mean, unless it's totally infested with small hive beetle, which it won't be because you live in Massachusetts, thank God. Um, so, <laughs> it's true. Okay, so, um, when you are trying to, to do swarm prevention without making increase, you, can, you want to make sure that we have plenty of room for storing nectar and pollen. You want to focus on reducing congestion in the brood nest by inserting frames of drawn comb right at the edges of the brood nest so the queen can keep laying. And then Google the Damari method, which basically is creating two hives on top of one hive stand. Um, it's very labor intensive, and the, and the actual result of doing this is simply manipulating your colony so you don't have to have two hive stands. But it's much easier to just split your colony through artificial swarming. And just remember that 90% of all colonies will attempt reproductive swarming every single year. So this is just a fact of reality. It is not a like, occasionally my bees might swarm. Like 90% of all colonies will attempt it and 10% that don't are too sick to do it. And that's why they don't attempt it. And so there is no such thing as colonies that are, that are like averse to reproduction. Um, so again, we can remove one of those three people and the hive will not swarm. And so that is what artificial swarming is all about. So these are just general facts about swarming. Um, and this is kind of New England centric. But the reality is most swarms move between 10 and two. So it's fair to say that like 95% of the time, if you find a swarm in your yard at 4 p.m., you do not need to give yourself shin splints getting your equipment to hive them because chances are they aren't planning on moving today. Now, there's always an exception to that rule because somebody's gonna say I had a swarm that moved at four o'clock and I have two, but the majority of the time, like if you come home after work and you find a swarm, you can pretty much just hive them and you don't have to freak out and try to do it in two seconds. You can do it in 20 minutes. They generally also move into the new location at that time, so when they fly off the next day, that's the same thing. Typically, swarms cluster near their parent colony, plus or minus 25 feet from the parent colony, which is fascinating to me when I go find random swarms, like in downtown Portland, like where is the 25 foot high, we had a swarm on the side of the main mall on Macy's, like 
flat up against the wall. I mean, the, the hive must have been on the roof. I mean, I just, there wasn't anywhere else it could possibly have come from. They typically prefer to move their location about a quarter of a mile. And so that's an important thing to think about when you're placing swarm traps. Okay, so here's just pictures of catching swarms. They're kind of fun. Um, so at the swarm, the colonies are scouting out new locations and they are getting ready to move into their new hive, which sometimes is a place like that. Um, that's a wild hive that I removed off of um, uh, Cushing's Island. Um, yeah, isn't that amazing? It is beautiful. Um, so swarms are really wonderful starter colonies. It's like finding a puppy. I mean, like two beekeepers, that's like literally how we feel. It's very exciting. Um, the reality is less than 5% of swarms will make it to their second year if they are not helped by beekeepers. And this has to do with varroa mite, it has to do with feeding, it has to do with just the reality and nutrition and everything else. And so it is helpful to the bees to hive them. It's also very important to me, although I do live on seven and a half acres of Portland, I don't think that the headline in the newspaper when I, my swarm goes and lands in some Massachusetts lawyer's yard who just moved up to Portland and now thinks that, you know, that my bees are harassing him. I don't think the headline is going to be very reasonable master beekeeper on seven and a half acres has a swarm that bugs a guy from Massachusetts. It's going to be beekeeper terrorizes neighborhood, right? <laughs> and so preventing swarms prevents neighbor relations problems and that's a really important thing. And so preventing and catching swarms is important. Also, you know, when bees move into people's houses, it can be difficult to get them out. That can, that can be a neighbor relation problem because, you know, rich Massachusetts lawyers all live in really simple, easy to take apart houses, right? That would be just a no sweat to take that out. Um, not that all lawyers are from Massachusetts. We do have a law school in Maine too. Um, here are a couple of swarms. You can see that there's a cluster here there's a cluster here and a big cluster here. There's a decent probability, we were talking about the 11 virgins back at the colony as well as the prime swarm, that this is actually an, oops, an after swarm, that this is actually probably three swarms together and they will sometimes move in together. Those swarms can, can absorb more than one queen because the new baby virgins don't have their playing cards yet, right? So they think there's only one even though there's three. It's kind of fun. But sometimes that can be a little bit trickier to shake. So, um, Back to swarming, what we're doing, we're getting ready to uh, issue with a third to half of the adult population leaving the hive. So here we are with our, our food and then our baby drones. This is the beginning of swarm season. Again, food in the brood nest. There's our queen. That's the only space she's got to lay on this frame is this one tiny little spot and they've brought in all this new food, right? So this is very typical swarm triggering. This is what things look like in the spring. I think that might be Rick Cooper's belly right there. <laughs> we were just talking about somebody I know. Um, so it's very important. Old time bee books make it sound like if you catch a swarm, it would be a really good idea for you to requeen that swarm with one of those good quality queens that you buy, right? Which is just the craziest thing I've ever heard in the world. It's a very kind of 1950s kind of, you know, like let's put our thumb on nature kind of concept. And swarm queens are absolutely not inferior to commercially raised queens. In fact, I would argue that they are vastly superior. And a big part of that is that queens in the natural world are almost always reared in queen right situation. If you think about swarming and you think about supersedure, those colonies are queen right at the time that they are feeding the egg to make the new baby queen and that is the natural way that bees do it and yet the, what beekeepers do is almost always rearing in a queen list situation which puts the bees into a much more kind of frenzied panicky state and so the best queen rearing methods simulate queenlessness for as short a period of time as possible and that you know we can talk about clipboard. But so here's some typical swarm cells, and these are some of the very best queens you can get. Again, typical swarm cell location. Again, typical swarm cell location. This is building off of a plastic home. Bees often hate to build plastic home, and it's a great place for them to put swarm cells. There's very religious little swarm. <laughs> um, so after the hive has swarmed, 
the parent colony back at the parent colony. They are queenless. They are hoping for their virgins to hatch and that one of them is going to make it back. And then the swarm cluster up in the tree is out in the wild, as out in the exposed air, often getting rained on, often at you know peril. And so it's risky time for both of them. And this is when you can be helpful. This is not a swarm cell. We understand that this is not a swarm cell because it is clearly the same age as all of this brood, right? And so this is an emergency queen cell. This is the, there was a big frame of eggs that the queen laid, and for whatever reason, the bees freaked out and picked this, this egg to make into a queen. And so just remember, sometimes people get so hung up on swarm season and being so worried about swarm season that the first queen cells that they see, they just start cutting them and then they don't even realize that they already have a queenless colony and they just cut their queen cell. So it's just remember, remember that that is not, that was not a good swarm cell. Swarm cells, swarm cells, swarm cells. Those all look like swarm cells and this is not a swarm cell because it's on the face of the comb in a place with all this brood the same age. Okay. So after your colony has swarmed, now that they are queenless and the swarm has been collected and is in your new hive, you can go back to the parent and reduce the number of queen cells in the hive in order to prevent after swarming. And that doesn't mean that you need to kill all those queen cells, although that is typically what you might do if you don't want to do a lot of increase. But what you can also do is move a lot of those queen cells, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about mating nukes. You want to be very careful of new baby queens. Often um, the queens have hatched and are running around. Virgin queens don't act like normal mated queens. Like we're used to normal mated queens kind of moving around, being in the brood nest, being in normal places, walking around pretty reliably. Virgin queens have a tendency to run around. They have a tendency to hide from the light. They, you know, they are going to be in a place where you can squish them um, as opposed to, um, you know, mated queens who are usually on the face of the brood comb. Um, new queens are easily frightened. They often will fly out of the hive um, because they can fly because they're small enough and then it's tricky to get them back. Um, so when you go in and check your colony after they swarm to reduce it, just be very careful and looking for the queens. Um, and then after you've removed the queen cells, leave them alone for three weeks. Just there's no sense in even doing anything except letting them do it themselves. You can, I mean, theoretically, in two weeks, there could be some brood in that colony if their queen was fast to mate. But that is going to be a tiny patch of eggs and larvae that is going to be covered in bees, right? Because the nurse bees are going to have had so nothing to do that they're going to be very excited when they get that first little bit of brood. So even if it is in there, it's going to be hard to see. By three weeks, it should be just starting to be capped, and then it's easy to see. And so there's no sense in rushing the look. All right, so there's my, there's my little virgin. This kind of flighty virgin, you can see she's kind of like got her wings up. She's looking not, she's looking not like a big mated queen. So this is basically the swarm queen calendar for the new baby queen. So on the day that the swarm issues, the day 25 is when you think that you're probably going to be having um, cat brood. And so this is... Basically, if you just mark your calendar after the day of the swarm, you can write these things down. I love this day 10 to 15 picture. And so, if you have time, let's just say that you have a new flexible job, or you're just retired, which unfortunately I don't have and won't be for a while. But if you have a swarm, and if you have the flexibility to be around in the middle of the day, you will see your queen doing mating flights. And what happens, what it looks like when your queen's doing mating flights is everybody's minding their own business, doing everything just like normal. And all of a sudden, there's a lot of activity leaving the hive that almost looks like a new swarm, like a little mating swarm. Because often the workers will kind of emerge with the queen. They get so excited by her going out that they kind of flurry out. And then she goes and she mates with the drones, as we all know, in the air. And the ones that succeed at mating with her um, die, leave their gift to the world, and expire where they fall. But the ones that do not succeed at mating with her chase her home wishing that they could have done it. And so what it looks like is a big 
I mean, we all know that drones are noisier, right? I mean, you can hear the difference. Is this noisy, big flurry of activity comes back? It looks like drones attacking the colony. And what it actually is, is the virgin flying in and them chasing her. And so it's very fun to watch this. This is a really dynamic, it kind of winds up the other bees in the apiary. So if you just happen to see a swarm and you happen to have a flexible schedule, put this calendar on your, put this window on your calendar and make a point of like going and reading a book in your bee yard in the middle of the day during that window. And chances are you'll see some amazing stuff that you don't usually get to see. And this is the same thing that happens when you start rearing queens and having mating nucleus colonies. This kind of stuff is happening all the time, and it's super, super fun. Okay, so here's a little baby virgin who's actually emerging from the hive. This is another thing that you'll see after your hive has swarmed. Um, the, you know, the virgins come out. Sometimes there are several of them. Sometimes they fight. Sometimes they don't. Um, and then once they're laying, you can mark them. I think I have another picture of a virgin. Can you see her abdomen right there? Like this is what you're often looking at when you're queen rearing. Is like you're you're not seeing that gorgeous perfect picture that way. Like that's that's easy to see. But when this is you know this big long abdomen is what you see when you're um, starting to look for queens. So when you find eggs and brood, mark your queens. I always mark every queen I see unless she's a virgin. Um, I'm very big into the marking protocol. Marking pens are very inexpensive. Um, you can buy them from your bee suppliers, but you can also buy them from paint stores. I mean, these are not like bee marking pens. These are acrylic marking pens that people use for beekeeping. And so you don't have to stick to the queen protocol of white, yellow, red, green, blue. I like to use, well, white is hard, hard to do, although you can buy a cream color. There's also hot pink, which works really well for red. There's also lavender, like you can buy light blue, is much easier to see than the royal blue that they sell in the bee catalogs. And so um, I'm a big fan of marking in the protocol-ish so that I can tell how old my queens are, but I also like to see, use colors that are easier to see. Um, here's another virgin on the outside of the hive. Um, it's interesting when you see things like this, a little puddle of bees on the ground. If you ever see a little puddle of bees on the ground and you know that you didn't just spill some honey on the ground, investigate because there's always something going on. And it often has to do, this is like, this is a virgin who had fallen out of a swarm actually. Like this is, you know, um, there was a swarm in the air and I think that that was a, vir a virgin had gone with it. And so there was just a few little bees with her. So I caged her and stuck her in a mating nuke. Okay, so when you catch swarms, this is really important. This is like the other one thing that I want you guys to all remember for the rest of your lives that I said. Um, always, always, always hive swarms onto foundation or foundationless equipment. And the reason that I'm going to say that is, um, let's see if I've got my things. Well, hold on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll come back to it, but that was very important. Is that the biggest, one of the things that you can semi-retain is that if you install a swarm onto uh, foundation, they're the fastest group of people to draw foundation ever because they're, the swarm is all primed up, ready to secrete wax and really wanting to draw comb. And so well, they will draw plastic comb, they will draw like all the crap that you, that your hives would have rejected all this time, like some ding dong gave you plastic equipment and you could never get bees to use it. The swarm will do it. They'll draw out just about anything. They'll draw foundationless frames if you want really well and they'll put all worker comb in instead of putting it all to be droning. It's wonderful. If you have to hold a swarm, meaning like you went and captured a swarm in the morning and then you had to go to work, what are you going to do with the swarm until you can get home? This question is you want to put them in a cool, dark place. So if you have a swarm inside a box, like let's say a cardboard box like that you might get a reams of paper in, and you poke a few small holes in it so that they have air, you can take this and you can put it in the closet at work, the temperature controlled, dark, cool closet. Needs to be below 70 degrees or so. And what you're doing is simulating nighttime and so they will cluster in there. I, when I used to work at Allagash, we had an open office, and you know, of course, I talked to beekeepers on the phone all day, particularly during swarm seasons, calling me up. And literally, if you called up Allagash Brewing Company Accounting Department right now and said, what should you do with bees? They would all stand up and say, put them in the basement. 
Smith. You know, like that's it. That's the only thing that they can remember me ever saying about beekeeping is me just telling people, put them in the basement. But that's really where the best place is, you know, a, a New England basement, cool and dark. Um, if you have a super bright daylight basement, you need to get it dark where they are. So put your swarm in a box and then put a big refrigerator box over it. That would make it dark. Um, but you want to simulate nighttime and they will stay quiet. And then take them home and hive them. And then once you hive your swarm, you want to feed them for several weeks. There's no reason, there's no reason not to feed a swarm. Like, I know that some people have this whole thing about like feeding bees, artificial sugar, is like makes them lazy or it does bad things to them. And that's just the biggest load of crap I've ever heard in my life. I mean, bees will forage for all kinds of sweet liquids. Nectar is their primary one, but if they, can, if they can't find nectar and they come across you know, sugary soda in people's recycle bins, they will collect that because they need carbohydrates. And they don't care. Uh, if you're feeding them the carbohydrates that they need to secrete the wax, because of course that's what happens. You, when you eat carbohydrates, you secrete wax, like sweating it out of your body. And so when you feed them, it gives them the energy to do the foraging. Forcing them to spend the energy to collect the carbohydrates to get the carbohydrates it slows the process down. If you feed bees sugar syrup so they can secrete wax, they will spend much more energy collecting pollen and rearing brood. And it just gives them that much more of a head start. And if bees had opposable thumbs and money, they would buy sugar. I guarantee it. Um, yeah. So, okay. So if you want to see a funny video of me cracking myself up, you can go on the Google or YouTube and see Aaron Forbes catches a swarm and it's just like a quick video of me. I got called to a swarm when I was in a tree and up in Lewiston and it's fun and I thought it was the funniest person I know. And so the home, I gave the homeowner my phone and I was like, take a video of me catching this swarm. Anyway, so if you want to look at um, swarm catching, that's a cute video. There's Cindy B catching a swarm at EIS a couple of years ago. She's a total badass, never wears a veil, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, she likes to be a show off, um, likes to make the bees run into the hive, but you know, swarm catching is super fun. Um, and there's us catching another swarm and we had hoisted the, um, the swarm box that we had put that we're gonna come back later that night and come take it down from the tree from the people of the yard. So we're all giggly. Look at that, so cute. Okay, um, sometimes if you could see the rest of this, this is like I'm in a bucket. This was actually at an open hive inspection. We looked up and we're like, oh, let's get that too while we're there. And they're like, no problem, let me get my tractor. Um, okay, this is the thing that I was saying about foundation. So, do you guys all know who Tom Seeley is? Do you know who Juliana Rangel is? One of his students, she now is, she's at Texas A&M now. The work that she did when she worked for Tom was all about who decides to go with the swarm. Like they marked all the bees in the observation hive, like literally marked every bee in the observation hive, got them all ready to swarm, the new baby virgins are piping, and then they would cage the queen. And so the bees would go flurrying out, trying to get the queen to go, and then they had caged her so that they couldn't go, and so they'd come back. And then the next day, they'd do it again. And the thing is, different individual bees go each time, which is fascinating, that they like decide impulsively on the day of the swarm whether or not they're gonna be part of it. The other thing that's important to know that the other thing that her research was is the scout bees start scouting before the swarm even issues. Like the scout bees start scouting from the parent colony before the swarm goes out. And so now we have a group of individual bees going around snooping in people's buildings, other dead beehives and whatever in areas that they normally do not poke around. Like this is not robbing, this is scouting. And so if the scouts go out and find a colony that died over winter from AFB, whether it be in a building, a tree, or a beehive, and they consume honey from that colony because it's in there, they were scouting, but then you know, hey honey, Nobody turns down food, right? I mean, bees do not turn down food. They're not gonna get into a colony that has comb that they're looking to scout in. And if there's food, they will bring it back. They're not gonna just ignore it because they don't ever go around single tasking. They always will multitask. They're gonna bring that AFB spore honey back to the swarm in their body, right? And if they do that, and you hive the swarm on drawn comb, 
then they will regurgitate the AFB spore containing honey into a cell and store it for food later. And it is possible that that AFB spore food will be fed to eggs and larvae, and then now you have a colony infected with AFB. When they, the parent didn't have AFB, and the, put, the hive that you put them on, the comb didn't have AFB, what happened is they were scouting locations and they sped into, this, into the cells. Are you following me on that? If you hive them on foundation, they don't have any cells to spit the honey into. And so they consume it, and they secrete it, and there is no transmission. And so that's why you always want to hive swarms, even if they're in your own yard, even if you know the colony, because you don't know what they've been poking around in, and they've been poking around in places that, you, that they normally wouldn't have done. Yes, question. Um, so I've heard that when you do catch a swarm, you give them a little bit, so that the queen can start laying, and that they'll want to stay there. Is that not true? Would you say have zero? I, she, the question is, do you want to give them a little bit of drone comb? It's so tempting to give them a little bit of drone comb, isn't it? Like, particularly when you have it, because you're right, the queen can start laying. But they, if they have been poking around an AFB, they will also store that food. And so the answer is none, zero. And really, bees rarely, rarely abscond from hives that you install them on. Like, the only time that I have ever had a swarm abscond from me installing them in a hive that I fed was into a top bar hive. No kidding. You had a question. Yes, um, if you're putting swarm traps out, like um, nukes high up with four or five frames, would you do the same thing, foundation or foundation less? And the question is, in your swarm traps, would you put foundation or foundation less? Um, Yes. Um, however, drawn comb is really attractive to swarms as a location. And so if your swarm trap is somewhere where you are absolutely minding it, so like, okay, I have probably 15 swarm traps out in my yard at any time, including I have one literally on the balcony of my bedroom. And so every morning I get up and I'm like, you know, look at it and nothing is happening and nothing is happening. And all of a sudden one day there's people looking at it, you know. So I immediately go around and look at all the other swarm traps to see who's looking at them, try to figure out if I have a swarm in a tree or if it's just coming from the hive. Those swarm traps do in fact have drawn, have found, have drawn comb in them. But if a swarm moves in, I'll take the drawn comb out and shake the bees off. So I basically trap them, I attract them with it, and then I take that frame away from so, them. So AFB is really important because when Tony Janzak was first hired as our state apiarist in 1986, nearly 20% of all hives inspected had American Falbury. This is why we have an apiary inspection program, is to combat this disease. And so if you think about it, I mean, we all know as soon as somebody, as soon as you tell a new person that you're a beekeeper, they're like, my uncle used to have bees and I have his old equipment. Would you, you know, I'll give it to you or I'll sell it to you or I'll whatever. 20% of that equipment has AFB spores, probability is. So if people give you equipment, you should absolutely take it and make like it's the nicest thing that they've ever done and bring it home and burn it. Literally. I mean, that is what you should do with used equipment, and this is why. And so it's really important to realize that, um, and AFB was probably worse here in Massachusetts, Maine. No offense, no offense to your state apiary program, but it is not as strong as ours. And the reason that ours is stronger is because we have the blueberry pollination. But um, I would suspect that your AFB was probably worse then and is probably worse now. And AFB in Maine is on the rise because of new beekeepers. We used to be around 1%, and now it's closer to 3 because new beekeepers don't know anything about um, diseases. So, you know, what to do when your swarm, well, here's your hive, and there's your swarm, and you can't do the catching. And it's funny, I was just telling this the other day. I used to have, when we first started bees, well, let's just say, I'll give you the short version. If you have a nice convenient tree that the bees swarm to every time in your yard, they will tend to swarm back to the same location because bees have a sense of smell that is 40 times better than dogs and they're attracted to the pheromone that got left when the swarm clustered on the tree. And if it happens to be a nice convenient place in your yard, do not cut that thing down. 
Because if you do, then they'll find a new place and it may not be as convenient. Um, okay, so Tom Seeley, you can watch his wonderful videos on how they decide where the bees are going to go and all the communication techniques that happen around swarming. But he basically has done all this research on swarming and swarm traps. And you can read his great um, pamphlet, you can download it, where is it? I guess it's probably here. There it is, Bait Hives for Honeybees. If you want to learn about exactly how, why the right things are right, then um, Tom Seeley's work does it. But so, um, basically what they want to be is a fully enclosed cavity, the size of a single deep hive body, with a four inch entrance, located eight feet off the ground, or 12 or 15 is better, or higher is even better, and swarm lures and attractants like uh, lemongrass oil and commercial swarm lures are very effective. Um, they increase the chances of discovery, basically, and then if your cavity is the right thing, then the voting is what um, Tom Seeley's book talks about. So, um, if you have, if you're an urban or suburban beekeeper, which I think all of you probably are, you should definitely have a swarm trap out, if for no other reason than to just be acting like a responsible beekeeper. And so that when your hive swarms into your next door neighbor lawyer from Maine who just moved down here um, and has all got a chip on his shoulder, um, that you can at least say that you made every effort to be um, responsible and not terrorizing the neighborhood. So here is a picture of a plant pot style swarm trap in my yard that the bees are moving into. Um, you can buy those plant pot things, um, the plant pot style, these fiber pot traps from bee suppliers, but this is actually just a, literally a plant pot from a local garden place with some T111, or that's actually real plywood on top, and you just block up three of the four holes and make a little swarm trap. So they're very easy, they're inexpensive, um, you can see this is that same swarm, now landed a little further. Um, and then you can make them attractive. So this is a question. If you're gonna make a swarm trap, like which of these things is gonna make the hive the most, make your swarm trap work best, right? Because lots of people kind of go, ah, and they freak out and they see a swarm and it's too high up and now you run around and you try to make a swarm trap. What you wanna do, you can use commercial swarm lure, which so you need to plan ahead and have bought that. You can put a frame of empty comb because it will be very attractive, but you never want to put a home comb with honey in because a comb with honey will attract the attention of robbers and no self-respecting swarm is going to move into a colony that's being actively robbed. Pollen is sort of okay in a short-term situation, like if you have a frame, the only frame of drawn comb you have has some pollen, you could put that out there, because bees don't really rob pollen, but it's not something that I would leave long-term, because of wax moths, and you never want to put a frame of brood inside. Um, there is a method of catching swarms out of trees where you actually put a frame of brood onto like a stick and like physically put it into the swarm and the swarm will crawl into the brood, that is one thing, but that is not the same thing as putting a frame of brood into a swarm trap, because they, they will just die. Okay, so this is something that's important to think about. We all know about the round dance and the waggle dance, right? That the round dance is how bees communicate the idea of there is something that I want to tell you about that is within 100 meters of where I am right now, I say, have a sip of tea, Let's hand it to you, trophallaxis, and then I dance the round dance. And all I say is, there's tea within 100 feet of here. You can get some. That's the message. However, if the tea is more than 100 meters from here, I will actually waggle dance, and I will say it is over there on that bleachers, exactly there to within one meter. And so if your swarm trap is less than 100 meters from your uh, cluster, they're stuck with the waggle dance, which just says, swarm tap smells like this, and waggle dance. But if it's more than 100 meters from your hive, they can point at it. And so it's better to put your swarm trap farther away because the bees can describe its location to each other much more easily. And so that has to like collaborating with your cool neighbor who's like two doors down that you're like, dude, can I put a swarm trap on the back of your garage? Would you mind that? You know, that's a good idea. Um, now, 
The other thing that's important that I don't have real scientific proof of, but one of the things that people are wondering about and trying to study, I don't know if you guys read those articles a couple of years ago about how bees, they figured out that bees can distinguish the faces of different people. Um, but one of the things that we know that bees can communicate ideas about is sound and taste. There's mounting evidence that they can communicate the concept of color. We just don't know what the word is. Like, how is it that they are communicating color? And so this is a very attractive color for bees. If you put uh, feeders out and then move the blue feeder from where it was, they will often continue to go to the blue feeder. And even it seems like that they are telling the nurse, the, the, they're telling the next forager behind them blue, as well as feeder location right here. And so this is a col color that many, that bees can say. I'm just saying, I don't know how they say it, but they can. And so if you make the lid of your swarm trap be that color, then they can round dance, I mean, they can waggle dance, point exactly to it, and say it's blue, which is, again, going to increase your probability of getting the foragers to go there. Does that make sense? So this is Tom Seeley's, uh, I, do, I don't know if you guys have been following his work on following the wild bees, but it is not a coincidence that this is the color that he uses for his little bait doodad. Like, that's why it's blue. Okay, so when you get the swarm trap, when the bees are in the swarm trap, then what do you do, you know? And so you need to get them out of the swarm trap, particularly if it's plant pot style, or if it doesn't have any comb in it at all, you know, or, and get them into a hive. So we want to rehive the colony as close to the location to the swarm trap as possible until you can move. So if the swarm has been in the swarm trap for five, four or five days or longer, you're going to need to actually put get them out, put the hive there, and then move them at night as if it was a regular beehive on the ground. Um, so let me see if I, so this is a swarm in my yard, that one that I showed you way up in the tree, that's a close up. And here they are coming to a Song dog food box. They just have the handle open. This is my, one of my earlier experiments in successful swarm trapping. I, you know, freak out, put a bunch of swarm traps, and that was the one that worked. Here again is that one that is the plant pot style bees coming in, bees landing, and then I just hive them. The tree is right behind. I put them into these three boxes of drawn, of, I'm sorry, foundation, and then this is a feeder above, so I'm immediately feeding them. And it's, when you're in the middle of a swarm, it sounds like, it's very stimulating, right? I mean, it sounds like water coming from the sky. I mean, it is amazingly um, attention grabbing, and yet, when it's over and the whole rest of the world has moved on, it's like nothing ever happened.